things in regulations that gets in the way. Peter Alders. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Orkney and Shetland for securing this debate and my honourable friend, the member for Banff and Buchan, for leading it. And also, I thank the Backbench Business Committee for granting it. Mr Deputy Speaker, I should state at the outset that I chair a community interest company, Reef, that is the renaissance of East Anglian fisheries, and my comments will focus on the inshore fleet and also the marketing, processing and retailing of fish in the east of England. The UK's departure from the EU was intended to mark the start of the revival of the domestic UK fishing industry. We are yet to properly grasp this opportunity, primarily due to the poor terms for the fishing that were negotiated and are contained in the EU-UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. The Government have put in place the framework for improving the sector with the Fisheries Act of 2020, which provides for the preparation and implementation of regional fisheries management plans, and also with the creation of the UK Seafood Fund. Yet, for many in the industry, two and a half years on from the signing of the TCA, we are still yet, but we're still very much still on the starting grid there has been no significant improvement in business outlook and, in many respects, the situation has got worse. The industry has also been hit hard by the cost of living crisis, high energy and fuel costs and labour shortages. Mr Deputy Speaker, I shall briefly highlight some of the challenges that the industry is facing in East Anglia. Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex adjoin fisheries ground 4C in the Southern North Sea, which is one of the richest fishing grounds in Northern Europe. But I'm afraid that the catch opportunities for local fishermen remain poor. This is because we do not have full control over our own waters, and the inshore fleet, which fishes sustainably, has to, complete, has to compete with larger vessels, often non-UK registered and often super trawlers. It is vital that this situation is addressed when the Trade and Cooperation Agreement is renegotiated in 2026, and the UK should also consider introducing measures to allow the inshore fleet to fish exclusively in the 12 nautical mile zone, this would not only benefit coastal communities and local economies, but also fish stocks. Mr Deputy Speaker, whilst I acknowledge that it is, this is an issue that does not fall within the remit of my honourable friend the Minister, as we have heard, the requirement for fishermen to gain a ML5 medical certificate is causing enormous worry and distress within the inshore fleet particularly for those operating single-handed vessels who risk losing their livelihoods. The feedback that I have received from one fisherman is that when he rang his doctor's surgery, the receptionist had never heard of a ML5. When he got his appointment six weeks, seven weeks later, he had to print off the 14-page form and take it with him, and then he had to pay £125. The doctor then expressed the opinion that the ML5 was far too strict and detailed and that it was easier to pass a medical to drive an HGV or a 52-passenger coach. Yeah, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm afraid, that, as we've heard, that this is an ex another example of British overzealous gold plating and I would um, urge my honourable friend and her colleagues in DEFRA to liaise closely with the noble Baroness Veer to streamline this process. Yeah, yeah. I'll give way on that point. Again, this, this, it, it's just so clear how colleagues feel. But it's absolutely um, right that we also take into account that the Department may well say that none of the people who have applied for the medical certificate have been rejected, but many have been referred, and that process takes a great deal of time. And that is also not really helping the process, because it's adding to the stress. And the fact is, is he, like I and others in this House, will have fishermen who will not want to carry on doing it because of the added bureaucracy. Is that not the case in his own constituency as well? 
Admiral Gladstone, that in in intervention, I'd agree entirely with that. The inshore fleet, I believe, is the future and the lifeblood of this industry. And it won't have a future if there isn't an inshore, if, it, if there aren't um, those fishermen to actually operate those vessels. And very often, they do do it on their own. Mr Deputy Speaker, a vibrant fishing industry can play a vital role in levelling up and uplifting left-behind communities all around the UK. But to do so, it does require fish to be landed locally and then marketed, processed, sold and ate locally, but with specialist high-quality products for which the UK has a long-established and enviable reputation being sold further afield, whether that is in London's finest restaurants or around the world. This is a particular challenge that Reef recognises, and in the com coming months they will be working up a seafood strategy for the east of England. Mr Deputy Speaker, unfortunately, this vision is in danger of being undermined by the Brixham fish markets strategy of setting up hubs, and I have sent an email to my honourable <laughs> friend saying that I was going to mention this particular issue, and I'm sure when I've stated my case, he may want to intervene, and I'm very happy to take that intervention. But the Bricks and Markets strategy of setting up hubs all around, what they've been doing, setting up hubs around the UK, where local fishermen deposit their fish, which is then transported by road for sale in Brixham. In the short term, I acknowledge that this sales outlet is attractive to many fishermen due to the higher prices being offered. But in the longer term, its consequences could be disastrous. A cartel or monopoly could be created to which fishermen would be beholden, and we would then have squandered that once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to breathe life back into coastal economies all around the UK. The I will give <laughs> Does the Honourable Gentleman accept that it isn't, this isn't isolated to Brixham? Plymouth Fish Market also overland fish to the market. They also sell remotely. Um, so it's not something that is just specifically isolated to one particular market. I thank, thank my honourable, my, the honourable lady, my honourable friend, for that intervention. And yes, I acknowledge that. And, but I'm, I'm also I'm drawing on the experiences of what is happening in the east of England. And Brexit and levelling up in so many respects is about giving opportunities to very local communities and local fishing, in, fishing sectors to make the most of that opportunity in those local locations. We've heard so much during the Brexit negotiations of, and I see it in Lowestoft, of, and you have a Lowestoft producer organisation which is, has an office in Lowestoft, don't land any fish in Lowestoft, they land them in, they land them in, um, in Holland, in the Netherlands. Um, it's not much better if that fish is then actually then taken over land and sold in Brixham or wherever that may be, to, that would be, and that is not, that is to the detriment of the community that I represent, which yearns to take advantage of this opportunity. I give way to my honourable friend and Dr. Nets. Honourable gentleman, allow me to intervene. Um, I, I mean, I, I strongly oppose him suggesting that Brixham is a cartel, and um, I, I feel that is the wrong language to use on this. But I might just say, in the interests of coming to see actually how this might be replicated, as the Honourable Lady from Cornwall has said already, by other businesses and organisations, perhaps he would come down and see uh, the organisations, the Brixham Trawler Agents, to see how actually this is something to be welcomed by communities across our coastal areas, and actually see how other businesses can take hold of it, take ownership, and so we can find ways in which which we can land not just more fish in Brixham, but across all of our respective ports. I, give, I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. What I, what I would say is we, we look at any... There is not as yet a cartel or a monopoly, but what I am doing is I am flagging up that if we don't watch it, that is what could happen, and that would not be for the benefit of the wider... UK fishing industry. 
I would also. Uh, can I just start make a little bit more bl- bl- intervention? I, I will give way to my friend now before I come on to my next point. Just before we move on from this uh, topic, uh, I find it fascinating. It was not something uh, I was aware of that was uh, happening in Brixton, but it does bring to mind the fact that in Peterhead, in my constituency, we've got one of the largest fish markets, state of the art fish markets in the country, if not Europe. Um, and catches from the west coast of Scotland and the islands find their way over to Peterhead Market by road much faster than if those boats were to come around and land. So it can work, but I appreciate it can work in different places in different ways. And might I suggest to uh, not only the chair of the APPG, but also the treasurer, that maybe we might take uh, the honourable member for Tottenham up in his uh, uh, invitation to see how it might be proposed. I thank my, my honourable friend for that intervention. What if we... If I, look, if I look at my constituency, Lowestoft was the fishing capital of the Southern North Sea. For fishing, the fishing industry in the east of England, which yearns to, if you like, regrasp that crown, the, this is what Brexit is about. And, as a, and my, my sense is we do need to build local infrastructure, local markets, local processing all around the UK, not concentrated in one or two locations. I would also so highlight just another disadvantage of that concentrating in one or two locations, and that's the complete lack of environmental sustainability of, dra- of vans, in this instance, driving from the East Anglian hub of Southwold, in the constituency of my right honourable friend and neighbour, the Secretary of State, all the way to Brixham, a six and a half hour drive of three and a 350 mile journey. That is not environmentally sustainable in today's world. I would urge my, my, my honourable friend, who I think is looking, listening, slightly bemused as to the approach that I'm raising, but it is an issue locally in Norfolk and Suffolk, which is causing a lot of concern and discussion in the industry. I would urge her to take it back to her colleagues and to look at this, look at the situation very, very, very closely. I suggest that one solution could be for her department to prepare what I would call a national strategic plan of regional fish markets, which would then be the focus of their local industries, and then money from the UK Seafood Fund could be directed and targeted at stimulating the creation of vibrant local fishing and seafood sectors all around the UK, not just in Brixham with those very impressive sales records in his, in his own market, but let's distribute that all around the UK. And the UK as a whole, will, I would suggest, will benefit most from such an approach. I give way to my honourable friend again. Perhaps now turning into a debate about Brixham, which of course I'm always very happy to have, but actually, you know, the model that they're doing in, in Brixham is also to look at where you can have hubs outside of Brixham. So it's not necessarily, as you're, you're right to make the point, that it's not necessarily environmentally friendly to having huge amounts of trucks coming through. But they are exploring where they can find hubs in new communities. And if any colleagues in this house are looking to have hubs set up, I'm sure the Brixham trawler agents would be delighted to come and see you. I would, I thank my honourable friend for the introduction. A single hub and spoke model for the UK, I would suggest, is not in the be- in the benefit for the benefit of the whole of the UK. What would be of benefit is hub and spoke models in individual regions. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'll leave this issue for further discussion and debate. And I, I welcome the fact that I have hopefully engendered a debate on this particular issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, my final point, as we've heard, is that the seas all around the UK are becoming increasingly crowded. I'm referring to the spatial squeeze that many colleagues have mentioned this morning and that the NFO, among others, have identified. In many respects, this activity, this enormous amount of activity, is good news, as it will create the business that will bring new and exciting jobs to coastal communities all around the UK. But... We do need to be responsible guardians. We, need to, we do need to be responsible guardians of our waters. There is a need for a more strategic approach to marine planning, with the needs of the fishing industry being properly represented. 
I am a great supporter of the offshore wind industry, but it is important to recognise that addressing physical that that adding physical structures in the sea at the scale that we are currently doing will change patterns of oceanic oceanographic processes and hence biological processes. Some of this change might actually be for the better, but much of it could well be could well lead to degradation, and it is vital that we ensure that this does not happen. In conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, the UK fishing industry is not yet in the last chance saloon, though I did listen carefully to the speech of the Honourable Member for Stockton North, but there is a very strong sense of missed opportunity. In the medium term, the government needs to prepare themselves for a tough renegotiation of the Trade and Cooperation Agreement in 2026. In the short term, there is a need for streamlined administrative processes and strategic thinking to ensure that the industry can, can flourish, not only in East Anglia, but all around the UK. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We're now coming to the wind-ups, which is 8 minutes 10, 10 and 2 minutes 